Welcome to Discovering the Ancient Paths. I am Pastor Mark Biltz of El Shaddai Ministries. We meet every Saturday morning in Tacoma, Washington from 10 a.m. to 1230. One of the most exciting things we do is to look at the New Testament through the lens of the culture during the very days of the Messiah. We also go through the Torah or the first five books of Moses throughout the entire year dividing it into 52 sections so over the year all five books are covered. Remember after the resurrection on the road to Emmaus how the disciples hearts were burning as Jesus opened up the Old Testament to them in ways they had never seen. That's what we do every week. Join us on the journey of your life right here at El Shaddai Ministries meeting every Saturday morning right here in Tacoma, Washington from 10 a.m. to 1230. We'll see you there. Amen and amen. Well, let's jump right into the Torah portion. It is called Ki Tavo, which means when you come. And this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1 and 2. And it says this, and it shall be when you come, Ki Tavo, into the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance and possess it. I want to stop there for a minute. This is amazing. What does real estate cost? I mean, look at the price of real estate. Can you imagine an entire country of Israel, what that real estate would cost if Israel had to purchase it? But no, God gives it to them. Uh, this is incredible. What a wonderful gift that God freely gave as an inheritance. But then look at what he says. It says, when you live in it, he says, you shall take of the very first of all the fruit of the earth, which you shall bring of your land that the Lord, your God, again, is giving to you. And I want you to put it in a basket and go to the place which the Lord, your God, shall choose to place his name there. We know that is referring to Jerusalem and we know it's referring to the temple uh, that was built. But think about this. After working uh, all day long in his field, for an entire season, I believe that the farmer could very well feel that the success of his crops belonged totally to his own hard work. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, what about the sun that God freely gave? What about the rain that he freely gives? All too often, we think the success of the work of our hands belongs entirely to us, and we don't even consider the God who allowed us to be alive to do the work or gave us the strength uh, to do it. You know, so here the farmer has to declare that he's understanding that God is not only the driver at the helm of history, but he's also the very source of his own personal bounty. And the other thing is by bringing their first fruits, they have to admit what their forefathers denied, they said that God brought them out of Egypt only to kill them. Oh, that's crazy. What a horrible attitude. Now they're having to declare that when they came in, it was so that they could take it and have of the bounty. And now God wants to have a little bit of first fruits. And notice nowhere in the Bible does it say how big the first fruit amount had to be. It was up to everyone's own heart. Let's look at verse 3 and 4 of Deuteronomy 26. It says that they're to go to the priest that'll be in those days and look at what they're to tell them. I profess this day to the Lord your God that I am come into the country which the Lord swear to our fathers to give us. Now, the purpose of this also is they have to confess that God keeps covenant, which is huge. And then it says the priest is going to take of the basket out of your hand and he's going to set it down before the altar of the Lord, your God. So here the farmer who's working this promised land that God literally gave to them uh, at no expense of their own. They have to testify that all of God's promises are true. Um, Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 10. Look at what it says. And now behold, this is what they have to say. I have brought the first fruits of the land. What is the Hebrew word for first fruits? It is the Hebrew word reshit here. And it means the first in place, 
the first in time, uh, the first in order or rank. It's supposed to be the very best. Now, what's amazing is you take that word Rashid, which means the first, and you put a letter bait in front of it. What do you get? You get Brashit. This is the first word of the Bible in English. It's three words in the beginning. But here we see that God is beginning at the very beginning. And so what's fascinating to me is when I think of the Feast of First Fruits, Messiah was the very first of the first fruit of offering from the ground in the promised land when he rose from the dead. Look at John chapter 12, verse 24. The Lord says, verily, verily, I say to you, except a grain of wheat fall in the ground and dies, it, may, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Well, what I think is amazing in that word, that very word brashit, the word grain in Genesis 41, 49 is bar, which is the first two letters of brashit. And Daniel 3.25, we see bar also means sun. And so here we see the son of God was the grain of the first fruits offering because we see within that word brashit, uh, it says right there in Leviticus 23.10, reshit is first fruits. And when you listen to 1 Corinthians 15.20, it says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and he became the first fruits of those that slept. So right here in the very first word of the Bible, we can see that Yeshua, Jesus, was predestined to die and become the first fruit of the grain offering that it's talking about in the Torah. To me, this is entirely incredible. Here Messiah becomes the grain of the first fruits offering on the very feast of first fruits to the very day. The other thing is this. They also would be singing when they're bringing their first fruits to the temple. The Levites who are in the temple, the priests, guess what they're singing? They have a hymn book and it's called the Psalms. And the priests would all be singing Psalms 30 on the Feast of First Fruits. And listen to what they're singing the very day they're bringing the first fruits of the grain offering in the temple. The very day Messiah, the grain offering, rose from the dead and is presenting himself before the Father in heaven. Listen to what all the priests are singing at that very moment from Psalms 30 verse 1. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and you've not made my foes to rejoice over me. And verse three, O Lord, you have brought up my soul from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down into the pit. Oh, my goodness. This is what they're singing. Only God, uh, the ultimate choreographer, could do something like this. So when they came to the Temple Mount, they would lift up the baskets on their shoulders and then they would enter into the court. And then all the priests would lay their hands under each basket and then they would wave the baskets in all four directions in order to demonstrate that the whole earth really belongs to God. And then the baskets were placed on the altar uh, and then they would read from the text that I just read. Well, let's go on now in Deuteronomy 26 and let's look at verse 8 through 11. This is part of what they would say. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm. I can't help but think of Messiah's outstretched arm on the cross. And that's how he brought us out of our own personal Egypt. And with great terribleness, with signs, with wonders. And then it says, and he has brought us to this place and he has given us the land. Do you know there are over 300 verses in the Torah that says God gave the land to Israel? Amazing. And it says it's a land that flows with milk and honey. If you remember in the Torah, they were whining and complaining, saying that the promised land, there was no milk and honey. And now they have to admit that that is not true. It does flow with milk and honey. And then they say, had to say, and now behold, I brought the first fruits of the land which you, Lord, have gave, given me. Can you imagine? The Lord is the one who gave them the first fruits as well. And then here's the commandment. You shall rejoice 
in every good thing which the Lord your God has given you and unto your house, you and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. Here God is commanding you to rejoice. Wow, what a horrible commandment. I'm not under the law. I don't have to rejoice. My goodness, God says, please, no whiny whinies. Uh, and, and so what do we see? We see that God fulfills his promises. The other thing is they also have to be thankful for the entire process of their history from the Exodus to the bringing of the first fruits in the land of Israel. They also when they're doing that, they're, they're thinking about the suffering of exile, the miracle of redemption, the end gathering into the land of Israel and the very fact that they are now raising crops. And here is the proof. It's the ripening of the first fruits. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Let's look at verse 16 through 19. Uh, this is a famous verse that's quoted in Hebrews where they say today over and over. But let's go to Deuteronomy 26, 16 and 19. It says today. The Lord your God has commanded you to do these statutes and judgments. You therefore shall keep and do them. Look at this with all your heart and with all your soul. You have today said that the Lord is your God and that you would walk in his ways. Keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments. And then it says, and you will listen to his voice. The problem is today, too many people are listening to all the other voices and there's so much noise going on. You can't even find God's voice. But look at this. It says, and the Lord has taken you today to be his peculiar people as he promised you. And then it says, and to keep all of his commandments. But look at the results. It says, if you do this, it'll make you high above all the nations that he has made in praise, in name, in honor, that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, even as he has spoken. Wow. Wow. When we keep God's covenant, when we do what he says, that truly sets us apart from the rest of the nations. So look at Deuteronomy 27, verse 9 and 10. It says, and Moses and the priests, the Levites spoke to all of Israel and listen to what they said. They said, take heed and listen, O Israel. Today you have become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore, obey the voice of the Lord your God. Do his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. We can hear the word today over and over and over. None of us know if we're going to have a tomorrow. We don't know we're going to have a tomorrow. We all assume it. We all hope it. Uh, but I tell you what, we need to commit ourselves to the Lord our God to do what he says today and not put it off. Look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2. It says, it will come to pass if, here's a big if, if you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all of his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And look at this. And all of these blessings will come on you and overtake you if you just listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what he says. Can you imagine having like a have you ever got hit by a big wave from the ocean if you're out by the walking in the beach? Or how about a big tsunami wave? How would you like to have a tsunami wave of blessings come and knock you over and you stand up and a big tsunami, another tsunami wave knocks you over and you're just swimming inundated with blessings. That's what God will do if we just hearken to his voice and listen to what he says. Can you imagine? He says, not only will these blessings come on you, they're going to overtake you. You can't even run away from the blessings if we just do what he says. Look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 8 and 9. Listen, the Lord is going to command a blessing upon you in your storehouses. How, can you imagine how many of you who have, believe there's a God who created everything? He said, let there be light. He commanded light and light appeared. How would you like to have that God command blessings to your storehouses? Amazing. And it also says to all that you set your hand to. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he has sworn to you. 
if you just keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Can you see why Satan doesn't want any of the Christians or God's people to keep his commandments, to think they're uh, legalism or done away with? Because he doesn't want you blessed. We need to understand the whole concept of what the commandments are for. As a matter of fact, a lot of Christians like to quote this verse, but they don't even understand the context. It says the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you want to be made the head and not the tail, you need to keep his commandments. It says, and you will be above only and you will not be beneath. If you hearken to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I'm commanding you today and overtake you. Oh, I'm sorry. It says, uh, let me see, Shh. to observe and to do them. Now look at Deuteronomy 28, 15. Here is the big but. It says Deuteronomy 28, 15, but it'll come to pass if you don't hearken or obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe, to do all of his commandments and his statutes, which command you this day. Guess what? All these curses are going to come on you and the curses are going to overtake you. Oh, my goodness. It's a two edged sword. We always have set before us a blessing or a curse. Which do we want? It's based on our obedience. That's what it is based on. Now, look at this. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 27. I'm going to go back a minute and let's look at verse 25 and 26. It says, cursed be he that takes a reward to slay an innocent person. Oh, my goodness. If I can't stand somebody and I call Joe and say, hey, Joe, would you go kill Pete for me? OK. And, and if that uh, person does that. Wow, it says, curse be he that takes a reward to slay an innocent person. So if someone comes to me and says, hey, would you go kill Bob? And he gives me a thousand dollars and I go kill Bob and I get that thousand dollars. This says I'm cursed. Now, can I say, no, sir, I pled the blood of Jesus. So I'm not cursed anymore. God's done away with that. I can now kill people for money. That's absurdity. OK, look at this. And all the people say, amen. Cursed be he that confirms not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people said, Amen. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, this is what Rabbi Shaul, known as the Apostle Paul, was referring to in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Listen. For as many as are of the works of the law or under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So does that people misunderstand that completely? Is this saying now we can hire hitmen to take out people we don't like because we're covered by the blood of Jesus? I don't think so. We need to have a better contextual understanding of what Paul is saying. Let's go look at Deuteronomy 27, verse 19 through 24. It says, cursed is he that prefers the judgment of the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and everybody says, amen. Cursed be he that lies with his father's wife because he uncovers his father's skirt. And all the people will say, amen. Cursed be he that lies with any manner of beast. And all the people are to say what? Amen. Cursed be he that lies with his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, amen. Cursed be he that lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people say, amen. Cursed be he that smites his neighbor secretly. And all the people shall say, amen. They can't say, okay, I'm not under the law. I can now do these things. The blessings are a part of the same law giving principles. So both blessings and cursings come from the law. You can't say y'all not under the law, so I'm going to be blessed. No, the blessings are under the law, just like the curses are under the law. Let's take a look here now at Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I'm taking select verses between 1 and 14. Listen to this. It says it'll come to pass. If you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all of his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord your God is going to set you on high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will overtake you if you just hearken to the voice of the Lord your God. Now, here it comes. Look at this. You're going to be blessed in this city. You're going to be blessed in the field. You're going to be blessed when you come in. You're going to be blessed when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They'll come against you one way, but they're going to flee before you seven ways. And again, the Lord is going to command the blessing on you in your storehouses and all you set your hand to. He's going to bless you in the land your Lord, the Lord God gives you. 
And then it says the Lord will establish you as a holy people as he has sworn, but it's only if you keep his commandments of the Lord and walk in his way. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail if you hearken to the commandments which I command you this day. So that's kind of a summary. Again, we need to hear this. So let's go to Deuteronomy 29 now, verse 19 and 20. It says, and it come to pass when he hears the words of this curse. This is so incredible. Listen to this. This is someone who heard all the words of the curses, all the words of the blessing. And look at what their attitude is. It'll come to pass. Whoever hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart. And he says, I will still have peace, even though I walk in the imagination of my own heart to add drunkenness to thirst. It says the Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man and all the curses that are written in the book will lie upon him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. This is basically saying whoever hears all the curses of this law and says, uh, I don't they don't apply to me now. Uh, I'm under grace. Guess what? If you still do those, you are in big trouble. <clears throat> now, here's the rest of Paul's story. Look at Galatians three, verse eleven. It says that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Well, guess what? He's quoting the Old Testament. Look at Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. The just living by faith is not a New Testament concept. It's an Old Testament concept. Grace is not a New Testament concept. It's an Old Testament concept. It says Noah found grace in the eyes of God. They're, the Jews never kept the law to justify their uh, going to heaven or whatever or not going to hell. They didn't even think that way. They already believed they were children of God. And the purpose of the law and obeying the law was not a matter of salvation. It was a matter of breaking God's heart or not. What he was saying, the Apostle Paul was saying that no one can rely on their justification before God based on their abilities in keeping the commandments. Why? Because we all fail. All of us break the law. We are justified by our faith. Our obedience is not to be done out of self-righteousness, but out of love for the Father. <clears throat> all of us have broken the law. And though it says uh, in uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Guess what? We've all sinned. We're all going to die. Uh, if you got a speeding ticket and you go before the judge and you say, yeah, but look at all the times I didn't speed. It doesn't matter. Well, it's the same thing. Not all of our righteousness can undo all the problems that we caused. And so there's a penalty. And the only way we can get out of that penalty is relying on grace so we're justified by faith in God's grace. It's always been that way. There, there is no dispensationalism. That's craziness. Okay. So let's take a look at this now. In uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 29, it talks about you will grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness. I can't help but think of the Messiah. Wow. Look at this. You shall grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness. What happened at noon at Passover when Messiah was hanging on the cross? It was turned dark at noonday. We see in Matthew 27, verse 45, from the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. That's three in the afternoon. That's three hours of total darkness. Here in Deuteronomy 28, 9, it's prophesying about the time when Messiah will be hanging on the cross for three hours. and It'll be totally dark at high noon. As a matter of fact, look at the prophet Amos chapter eight, verse nine and ten. It'll come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, I will cause the sun to go down when? At noon, this is referring exactly to when Messiah was on the cross and it turned dark at noon. It says, I will darken the earth in the clear day. I will turn your feast into morning. That's Passover. That's the feast it's talking about. It was a time of great rejoicing and now they're mourning. All your songs will turn into lamentation and I will bring sackcloth upon all loins, baldness on every head. I will make it look as in the morning of an only son. And Yeshua was the only son of God and the ender of as a bitter day. So let's look at the, the Haftor now 
in Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 3, it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen on you. Behold, darkness will cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the Lord is going to arise on you. His glory will be seen on you. And guess what? The Gentiles are going to come to the, your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Verse 5, and then you're going to see and flow together. Your heart will fear. It'll be enlarged. Why? Because the abundance of the sea, speaking of the nations, are going to be converted to you. The forces of the Gentiles are going to be coming to you. This is incredible. Look at verse 11 and 12. Therefore, your gates will be open continually. They'll not be shut day or night that men may bring unto you the forces of the Gentiles and their kings may be brought. Here it is. Underline this verse for the nation and the kingdom that will not serve Israel will perish. Yea, those nations will be utterly wasted. This is a promise. You all these nations. And I know right now we probably have close to 20 nations live streaming. Every single nation is going to come and serve the nation of Israel, especially when Messiah is there. Look at verse 14. The sons also of those that afflicted the nation of Israel will come bending to you. All those that despised you are going to bow themselves down at the soles of your feet. And they're going to call you Jerusalem, the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. I'll close with this verse. Look at Isaiah chapter two, verse one through three. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos saw concerning Judah. In Jerusalem, it'll come to pass in the last days, which is where we are. The mountain of the Lord's house is going to be established in the top of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. And look at this. All nations, not some nations, all nations are going to flow to it. Many people will go and say, hey, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths for out of Zion or Jerusalem will go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Why would the Torah be done away with if that is what is going to be coming out of Jerusalem when Messiah comes? I don't think any of us believe that God is a schizophrenic. I don't think anyone believes God is bipolar. Uh, God is not going to say, oh, the law is good. Oh, now the law is bad. Oh, now the law is good again. Uh, so we need to have a better understanding of what the Bible is saying. The other thing we see now, since all the nations are going to be coming to Mount Zion to hear the Torah, the Gentiles turning to Torah is the next prophetic move of God. And they will be noted forever as the first fruits of Zion in fulfillment of this prophecy. So you want to get on board. All the nations, all these Gentiles that are now coming back to Torah, you get to be part of the first fruits. How exciting. We're back to decoding the book of Ezekiel. We're going to begin with Ezekiel chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 1 through 3. Ezekiel says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel. Now you have to remember Ezekiel is over in Babylon. And so he is going to be looking to the west toward the mountains of Israel. And now he's prophesying against dirt. He's prophesying against the mountains of Israel. And look at what he's saying. God tells him to say, hey, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God concerning you mountains, concerning you hills, concerning the ravines and concerning the valleys. Behold, God says, I even I am going to bring a sword upon you. I will utterly destroy your high places. Israel had built high places on all the mountains and hills in Israel. And God is telling the mountains and hills that he's coming to destroy all of those high places. As a matter of fact, look at verse four and five. God says, your altars will become desolate and your sun images are going to be broken. And look at this. He says, I will cast down your slain men before your idols. I will lay the carcasses of the children of Israel before 
their idols. I will scatter your bones around your altars. Do you realize what God is saying here? The very idols that they loved and served will not protect them. They will be destroyed while also in the very act of their false worship. The very fact that they are where these false idols and altars are, God is saying he's going to destroy them while they're in the very act of worshiping these idols, number one. And number two, they're going to realize these idols they created would never protect them. As a matter of fact, about, let's see, a thousand years earlier was Moses. And God had told Israel they were to destroy all the altars. But because of Solomon, who built over a thousand pagan altars, they kept them. They figured if they're good enough for Solomon, they're good enough for us. And they expounded, expanded on all of the altars that Solomon built until there were thousands of pagan altars over all the mountains and hills of Jerusalem. Look at Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 30. God was prophesying of this event a thousand years before it happened. God says, I will send destruction on your high places, overturning your perfume altars, and I will put your dead bodies right on top of your broken images, and my soul will be turned from you in disgust. So here a thousand years before, God was telling Israel this is what was going to happen if you went down this path. Now, look at Ezekiel chapter six. Look at verse six through eight. God goes on to say, in all of your dwelling places, the cities are going to be laid waste. The high places are going to be desolate. Your altars are going to be laid waste and made desolate. Your idols may be broken and cease. Your sun images are going to be hewn down and your works may be blotted out. And the slain shall fall in the midst of you. Now you may ask, why is God doing all of this? What is going on? And why is God doing everything that's happening in the world today? This next phrase is the very key phrase to this entire chapter. And you're going to hear it over and over. And this is not so that the heathen may know he is the Lord. It's so his own people will know that he's the Lord. Look what it says after he says he's going to destroy their pagan altars. He says, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And yet look what he says. God says, I will leave a remnant though. And that you shall have some that escape the sword <clears throat> among the nations when you shall be scattered through all the countries. Now, this next verse is one of the verses I memorized early on in my Christian walk. And it blew my mind. This is one of the most powerful verses that you're going to want to memorize. You're going to want to remember because it really gives you God's heartbeat. Look at Ezekiel 6, 9. It says, and those that escape of you shall remember me among the nations where you shall be carried captives. And then God says, how that I have been anguished with their straying heart, which has departed from me. Another translation, God says, I am broken over their whorish heart, which has departed from me. This Hebrew word for broken and anguish, God is saying he has literally been broken to pieces, totally heartbroken over God's people who want nothing to do with him. They forget him. They purposely antagonize him and they leave. God's heart is saying his heart is completely broken over their straying heart. And he says, and with their eyes, which are gone astray after their idols. And it says they're going to loathe themselves in their own sight for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. Wow. Look at verse 10 and 11. Here it comes again. And they shall know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I would do this evil to them. Thus says the Lord God, smite your hand and stamp with your foot 
Oh my goodness, you can't, you can just see the image of people mad and they're stomping their feet when these kinds of things happen. They wonder why. And it says, I want you to say, alas, it's because of all the evil abominations of the house of Israel. This is why they're going to fall by the sword, by the famine and by pestilence. Do you get this? Listen, it doesn't say Israel is going to fall because of the enemy's superpowers. The enemies have no superpowers. If uh, Israel falls to the other nations, the reason is, is because God has turned his face away from them. And now they're going to fall by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. It's because of their own abominations and turning away from the God of Israel. Now look at Ezekiel 6, 13 and 14. Look at how it begins. And you will be certain that I am the Lord. When their dead men are stretched among their images, round their altars, on every high hill, on all the tops of the mountains, under every branching tree, under every thick oak tree, and the places where they made sweet smells to all their images... And my hand will be stretched out against them, making the land waste and unpeopled from the wasteland to Riblah through all their living places. And they will be certain that I am the Lord. Can you see this sentence, this phrase repeated over and over and over? I see two things. Number one, God wants to make certain that his people know he is the Lord. That's number one. And the other thing is God uh, it's measure for measure. You're worshiping your idols. Guess what? You're going to die in front of your idols, which are going to be smashed. And I believe right now God is taking down all of the idols. He's taken down sports. He's taken down Hollyweird. He's taken down all of these things, the things that we have idolized. God is in the process, just like he did in the Exodus, of coming against all the gods of Egypt. Now look at this. Here's Ezekiel chapter 7. This is verses 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God concerning the land of Israel. Look at this. An end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end upon you. God says, I'm going to send my anger on you. I'm going to judge you according to your ways and I will bring upon you all your abominations. The very thing that we adore, God is going to use it to destroy us if it's not him. As a matter of fact, look what God says here. My eye will not have mercy on you. I will have no pity, but I will send the punishment of your ways on you and your disgusting works will be among you and you will be what? Certain that I am the Lord. You know what is amazing? Get a load of this. This is incredible. You know what the word for end is there? Like maquettes is one of the Torah portions, meaning at the end. And here it's talking about an end. The end now is the end upon you. Well, guess what? That word and when you add the letter hey, the end, end is the kuf sade, ketz. That's end, kuf sade. You put the hey in front of it, ha ketz, you get the end. So the end is ha ketz, the hey, the kuf, and the sade. Well, do you know what happens when you add the letter hey onto the end of that? So you now have a hey. Two hays, and I can't help but think of the yud hay bob hay, the two hays from God's name. One was given to Abram, becoming Abraham. The other was given to Sarai, becoming Sarah. Well, when you take the end, which is ketz, and you put hay on the beginning, you have the end. You put a hay on the end of that word, guess what you get? You get an awakening. All of a sudden, when the end is coming, 
You can have, there can be an awakening, a revival, meaning they will recognize their faults. So God is bringing the end so that there will be an awakening that we may know that he certainly is the Lord. And that's what this is saying. Look how it goes again in Ezekiel 7, 5 through 10. This is what the Lord says, an evil even one evil. See, it is coming. And then again, it says an end has come. An end has come. Look, it's coming upon you. The end, the crowning time. Wow. I can't help but think of Corona here. The crowning time has come upon you, O people of the land. The time has come. The day is near. The day will not be slow in coming. It will not keep back. Uh, it says, oh, people of the land, the time has come. The day is near. The day will not be slowing. It will knock you back now in a little time. God says, I'm going to let loose my passion on you and I will give full effect to my wrath against you. Look at this. Judging you for your ways and sending punishment on you for all your disgusting works. My eye will not have mercy I will have no pity. I'm going to send on you the punishment of your ways and your disgusting works will be among you. And you will see. Here it is again that I am the Lord who gives punishment. See, the day is coming. See, it is coming. The crowning time has gone out. The twisted way is flowering. Pride has put out buds. My goodness. My, my, my. If this doesn't tell me exactly the time that we're living in right now. And one of the main things that God hates is pride. And that's exactly where the world is right now. But I'm hoping that there is going to be an awakening and people are going to return back to the Lord at the end. But uh, the thing we need to realize, and we've already said it, heard God say it over, and he says it over again, the time is coming when he will show no mercy, when he will show no pity. This is why we need to know what time it is. This is why we need to be on God's calendar. This is why we're in the month of Elul, which is the month of return. He's returning to earth very shortly, and we need to be returning to him. And while the king is in the field right now, we need to be examining our hearts examining our ways. I believe right now in world history where we're at that the twisted way of mankind is flowering. Pride has truly put out the buds and we need to be aware. As a matter of fact, look at Ezekiel 7. This is verse 15 through 18. It says outside there is the sword. So that's on the outside. Let's look at what's on the inside. Inside is disease and need of food. It says he who is in the open country is going to be put to the sword. But guess what? Whoever is in the town is going to come to his end through the need of food and because of disease. And it says those of them who get away safely to go and be in the secret places will be like the doves of the valleys. All of them will come to death. Everyone in his sin. I tell you what, our sins follow us. All too often we try to run from our problems, but guess what? The problems come with us. We have to repent. We have to turn to God so we can be cleansed from our sins. It says all hands will be feeble, all knees without strength, just like water. And they will put hair cloth around them. And then it says deep fear will be covering them. Shame will be on all their faces and hair gone from all their heads. Here's a point that I want to bring out that you may not have gotten, but you hear it over and over and over. But I'm going to say it in different words. The wickedness of the wicked contains the seeds of their own destruction. The wickedness of the wicked is where the seeds of their own destruction is found. Wickedness ends up destroying itself. I think one time I saw a bumper sticker uh, that was more appropriate. It says, uh, uh, 
the devil didn't make me do it. I went ahead and did it myself. Uh, and this is the problem. We have to realize we can't blame the devil. Uh, yeah, the devil may have tried to make us do it, but we have free will. We have a free choice. And we need to realize so often the seeds of our own destruction is sown by our own behavior. God doesn't destroy us, really. He just allows our own wickedness to destroy us. This is why we need to be planting good seeds of the word of God. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 7. This is verse 19 through 23. Look what they're going to do. You think your silver and your gold is going to help you in the time of trouble? I don't think so. Look at this. They will put out their silver into the streets and their gold will be as an unclean thing. Their silver and their gold will not be able to keep them safe in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They will not get their desire or have food for their need. Why? Because it has been the cause of their falling into sin. Wow. Here again, people, they put their faith in silver and gold and the silver and gold is the very cause of their falling into sin. If you've been storing up wealth, thinking that wealth is what's going to keep you safe. I can't help but think of all these people building their little uh, bomb shelters for being hidden away in the time of trouble. Tell you what, nothing is going to save you but Yeshua, Hamashiach. You better not be trusting in silver or gold or your all of the food that you're preparing. There's nothing wrong with preparing food. There's nothing wrong with making provision. But your trust has to be in the Lord. Bottom line, just like Israel, Israel too often trusted in the other nations to save them. Now, the other nations need to be involved. The other nations need to be protecting Israel from their enemies. But Israel has to ultimately trust in God for their protection. But I think it's amazing that the very silver and gold Ezekiel tells them that they're trusting in to save them is the cause of their falling into sin. Don't allow money to be the cause of you falling into sin, consuming it upon yourself. Now is the time to be investing it into the kingdom of God where you'll get a much better return. It says, as for their beautiful ornament, they had put it on high. They had made the images of their disgusting and hating things in it. God says, for this cause, I have made it an unclean thing to them. God says, I'm going to give it into the hands of men from strange lands who are going to take it by force and to the evil doers of the earth to have for themselves. Wow. And they will make it unholy. And my face, God says, will be turned away from them. And they will make my secret place unholy. Look at this. God says violent men are going to go into it and make it unholy. And then he says, make the chain for the land is full of crimes of blood and the town is full of violent acts. Wow. I, I think they're think, talking about Portland or Seattle or something. I mean, my goodness, look at all the violence. I don't know if you realize this, but in Genesis, when the flood came, the number one reason God destroyed the earth, it says, was because of violence. And look how violence, and not only is taking a place all over the world, many political leaders are promoting the violence, encouraging the violence, or being silent concerning the violence. And I don't know if you know the Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. That's exactly right. Let's look at Ezekiel. Chapter 7, let's look at verse 24 through 27. It's amazing. Listen to what God says. This is the reason that I'm going to send the very worst of all the nations. He's speaking of Babylon here. Why did God not send uh, Egypt after them? No, Babylon was the worst, most self-centered, heathen, pleasure-loving nation there was. 
And because that's where Israel was at, that's what they wanted. God said, okay, I'm going to send the very nation that you want to be like to come and to overthrow you. So God says, this is the reason I'm sending the worst of the nations. And guess what? They're going to take your houses for themselves. I will make the pride of their strength come to an end. Their holy places will be made unclean. Look at this. Shaking fear is coming. I don't know how many of you have ever been afraid before, but how about shaking fear coming? They'll be looking for peace and there will be no peace. I tell you what, right now, Israel is looking for peace. That's what they're trying to find. But there may be a false peace that's coming very shortly. Wow. Shaking fear. How many of you have ever been shaking in fear? I, I know a little bit about shaking fear. As I've uh, told many of you before have heard me speak, I've had guns at my head twice. And both times the gunman said, they're going to blow my head off. And I am still here. So I, I know what that shaking kind of fear is like. But this is where I trusted in the Lord. And guess what? I'm still here. It says destruction will come on destruction. And one story after another. It says the vision of the prophet will be shamed. Look at this. And the knowledge of the law will come to an end among the priests. For heaven's sake, the priests are the ones who are supposed to be teaching the Torah, teaching the law. And the priests are the first one who forsake the law or know nothing about it. It says, and their wisdom among the old. It's going to come to an end. It says the king will give himself up to sorrow. The ruler will be clothed with wonder and the hands of the people of the land will be troubled. God says, I will give them punishment for their ways, judging them as it is right for them to be judged. And they will be what? certain that I am the Lord. We hear that over and over and over. Uh, Even in the Exodus with Moses, God brought all the plagues on Egypt so that they might know that he is the Lord. And so the children of Israel might know that he is the Lord. The reason things are coming upon the earth is for the people on the earth to realize that Hashem is the Lord. He is God. That's why. And God, it says, shall not the judge of all the earth be right? God is the judge. Now look at this. This is incredible. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 8. Look at verse 1 and 2. It came to pass in what year? The sixth year. That's amazing. And it is in the sixth month. What month is that? The month of the lull, the month we're in right now, and the fifth day of the month, all right? Ezekiel is sitting in his house over in Babylon, and the elders of Judah sat before me, and guess what? The hand of the Lord God fell upon Ezekiel. And look at this. Ezekiel says, with the elders of Judah around him, he says, behold... A likeness as the appearance of fire. And from the appearance of his loins downward, fire. And from his loins and upward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of electrum. What he is seeing here is Yeshua, the son of man. Compare this to Revelation chapter 1. This is verse 13 through 15. Here John is seeing in the midst of this menorah, there's one like a son of man. He also was clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes are a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And it says his voice is like the roar of many waters. So Ezekiel is seeing the son of man. Now look, this is amazing. Chapter 8, verse 3 through 4. He put forth the form of a hand and he grabbed him by one of the locks of my hair on my head. And it says the spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven. 
Can you imagine being grabbed by your hair? They'd have a hard time grabbing mine. But can you imagine if you've got long hair and all of a sudden God just pulls you up and dangles you in the middle of heaven and earth? Wow. And here he's clear over in, his, in uh, uh, Babylon, Ezekiel is, but he's been brought up so high, he has a direct vision of what's going on in Jerusalem. I would be amazed to be one of the elders sitting around him when all of a sudden God picked him up by a lock of the hair, and dangled him between heaven and earth. I wish I'd had my binoculars. Look at this. It says, he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looks toward the north. OK, the temple faced east. So I want you to just imagine the temple facing east toward the Mount of Olives. And he's coming to the north, though he's uh, from the north. And it says there was the seat of the image of jealousy which provokes to jealousy. Now notice the idol isn't there. It's a, it's a seat, but it's an empty seat. So the idol isn't there. But that's where they say Manasseh had placed one of the idols that he had made that had placed on the 17th of Tammuz. That was the very seat where Manasseh had placed that idol on the north side. Now think of this, the north side in the holy place is where the table of showbread is. And the table of showbread represented like the first fruits, the bounty that the land produced. But by having this seat of jealousy there on the north, what Israel was saying was all of the blessings they got did not come from the God of heaven, but they came from that pagan God that was placed on this seat here where the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. And then Ezekiel says, behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. So it's like he sees the Shekinah right there on the northern side of the Temple Mount. Now look at verse five and six. Then said he unto me, son of man, lift up your eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north and behold, northward at the gate of the altar of this image of jealousy in the entry. This is where they would enter into the temple on the northern side. Everyone would see this image of jealousy as he entered the northern side. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, are you seeing what they are doing even the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn you yet again and you will see even greater abominations. Well, how many of you know God says we cannot serve two masters? Thank you for joining with us. We hope you learned something new today. Please partner with us in fulfilling the scriptures about taking God's Torah to the nations. You can watch this whole program for free, along with all of our other archive programs right from our website link shown below. We hope to see you soon at our location right here in Tacoma, Washington. See you soon.